This is TV Podcast Industries, and we're talking about Star Trek Picard, Episode 6, The Impossible Box. Joe True, fellow Trekkers, this is TV Podcast Industries, and we are talking about The Impossible Box, which is the sixth episode of Star Trek Picard. I am one of your hosts, John. I'm one of your hosts, Derek. And rounding out the group is not Chris. No, unfortunately, <laughs> unfortunately. he is still beamed away into the far-flung uh, world of the business trip. Mm. Uh, yes. He is back, but he is recovering from uh, very many late nights over the course of his time away. Uh, So he will be back with us very soon on Star Trek Picard, and I'm definitely looking forward to it because he's predicted a few things that I'd like him to talk about. I'm not even going to point that out. You guys know which ones he's predicted that are starting to come true. He has, hasn't he? And dare I say it, he has bought he has born no he has been aboard the borg ship yes maybe which assimilates any culture uh, within its way <laughs> well that's a reference to his job which we're not going to talk about on this podcast <laughs> but with storm jorge battering down our windows and doors and the coronavirus making sure everybody must stay indoors why not listen to some podcasts yes exactly yeah. uh Every cloud has a silver lining. Mm-hmm. I should also say as well in Klingon, Kapla as well very for everyone to our fellow Trekkies and Trekkers. Mm-hmm. I do, and I am very tempted to say Kaplunk, which is <laughs> of course um, that that game that we all used to play with marbles and sticks. Oh yes, yes, yes. I remember that. Um, but I, whenever I think of Kapla, I always think of Kaplunk. I'm sure the Klingon fans out there would not be happy that their language is being turned into that. That's be, that was taught in schools throughout the 90s and, and 90s, wasn't it? What, uh, well, in, in college, no, <laughs> no, the uh, Klingon language. Uh, you could take a course and actually how to learn it. So, yeah, uh, no, so there are some people out there that even our pronunciation of that word might anger them. <laughs> dare, hey. dare I say it? We studied maths, English, science, history, well, geography, art, music, theatre, and everything else in between, yes, including I'm, home ec. I'm talking about college now. In college, you can specialise in whatever subject interests you. That and, and is true. All learning's good learning. It is. As they say, no matter whether it's a made-up language like English, which is also a made-up language, <laughs> just happens <laughs> yes. to not be connected to a TV show. That's all. That is true. The tongue of Mordor as well. Yes, I think you the can. The dark learn, language. Probably learn the dark language somewhere. Anyway, we're all over the place at the beginning of our episode. <laughs> if you want to hear some more stuff, if you're stuck indoors and want to hear some more stuff that we podcast about you can go over to tvpodcastindustries.com subscribe to the podcast listen to some of the stuff that we have available for you over there or if you want to you can go over to our patreon at patreon.com slash tv podcast industries and listen to the first five episodes of our penny dreadful rewatch penny dreadful the first three seasons starred harry treadaway who we see a lot in this episode as an eric and um, but he played victor frankenstein in that show and i think he's fantastic over on Penny Dreadful. There's some great moments that we've had already in the first uh, season that we've talked about so far, and we're going to be talking about uh, the second season pretty soon as well, so uh, looking forward to seeing more of Harry Treadway over there. Yes, definitely. And of course, that is all building up to our coverage of Penny Dreadful City of Angels, Mm -hmm. which is out on the 26th of April. That's right. And I've been trying to keep myself reasonably spoiler-free for uh, City of Angels. But one thing I did learn this week, which I thought I'd share with the Star Trek Picard listeners, Brent Spiner, who plays Data... I'm sure you know who he is. <laughs> we played Data on, on uh, Star Trek Next Generation and also at the beginning of this series of, of Star Trek Picard. He has been signed on for uh, Penny Dreadful City of Angels. So this is a really good show to follow up Star Trek Picard, really, isn't it? Yeah, definitely. Um, so, yeah, a few nice little uh, actor crossovers and threads between these two shows. I will be highlighting another one uh, as well uh, during one of my points. Interesting. Um, and... 
As we were talking about language beforehand, mm-hmm. data or data is the eternal question on well, the minds of Trekkies and Trekkers, like potato, potato, <laughs> or tomato, tomato. Kind of, but that question was actually answered on the show when Dr. Crusher disappeared for a season and we had Dr. Pulaski on the show. She mistakenly called data, data, and wondered why he got so upset about the fact that she was calling him by that. And he said, well, one's my name. My name is data. The other word is data, and that's just how you pronounce that term effectively. So it has been answered on the show. So there, it is okay, data. excellent stuff. Yeah. Anyway, so the um, the debate is over. The debate is excellent. over. As excellent soon as it's stuff. begun. Yes. <laughs> but if you want to send us any thoughts that you have in any of the shows that we cover, just make sure you email us to feedback at tvpodcastindustries.com or you can join us over on our Facebook group at facebook.com slash tvpodcastindustries. A quick bit of feedback before we get into this episode. Um, it was over on Twitter. Mark McKinley sent me a direct message about uh, the La Serena hologram with the name Emmett that we discussed last week on the podcast because uh, we were wondering why one of them would have a name yes exactly yeah, and why and why everybody else didn't have a name they were all called the emergency medical uh, hologram or the emergency um hospitality hologram <laughs> so none of them had names but he had a really good point here mark says hi guys just listened to picard episode five podcast and the point about emmet i assumed emmet comes from emergency tactical as in eme slash t it's just faster to say than EMT or ETH, emerging, Emergency Tactical Hologram. You call them Emmet, especially in a battle situation. So perhaps Emmet evolved from that. That is an excellent uh, thought and one that I am wholeheartedly behind. Yeah. That's really good, actually. It's really good, Mark. And I hope I did justice because when I'm reading it in front of me here, it makes total sense. I hope I've did, done justice reading it out. Because it makes sense kind of creating a portmanteau out of a word that makes sense together because you can't do that with emergency medical hologram, but you can do it with EMT. I like, I like the idea of yeah. turning it into M. And portmanteau is very heavily used in the German language as well. Mm, very good. Very good. Well, let's get into this episode, episode six of Star Trek The Card, The Impossible Box. I just assumed before the episode was going to be going on that The Impossible Box was going to be the Borg Cube. But instantly, when you see Narek with that uh, Rubik's Cube type box yes, that he has. Yes, the Romulan Rubik's Cube yeah. of death. It's definitely a lot worse than a normal Rubik's Cube, isn't it? <laughs> a lot more uh, little secretive bits inside. Obviously, uh, because it's made by the Romulans, there's always secretive bits inside. But let's get into the episode. Um, this episode was written by Nick Zayas. Uh, Nick was an executive story editor for this season and was a story editor, editor on the cop drama Major Crimes as well. Um, so he's starting to kind of go up the ranks of, uh, of of writing effectively getting his own episode here which is quite cool yeah, um, good stuff yeah the episode was directed by Maya Ravillo um, she's directed this episode and episode 8 of the show and also directed the Star Trek short Trek Runaway and directed uh, Discovery Season 2 Episode 11 Perpetual Infinity a really good episode actually all of Season 2 was fantastic I can't really pick out one individually that was more better than the others but uh, definitely towards the end of that season every episode was just hitting such a high bar and also for our former gotham tv podcast listeners and viewers of the tv show gotham uh, may have directed uh, gotham season four uh, episode mandatory brunch meeting and season three the primal riddle two really good episodes of gotham so i'm really glad they brought me over to uh, to direct star trek picard yeah it's good stuff it, it does just show what a um close knit or or small world the um i suppose the tv and film industry is really absolutely yeah yeah but it's always great to have those kind of connections yeah you, you remember you know mandatory brunch meeting had jerome in there and had his gang in there that was really a really cool episode of uh of gotham as well so seeing seeing her working in a completely different type of structure with star trek is quite cool john do you want to tell us the official episode description for episode six of star trek picard sure picard and the crew track soji to the borg cube in romulan space where haunting memories resurface for Jean-Luc Picard. Meanwhile, Narek believes he finally found a way to safely exploit Soji for information. And exploit he does. He certainly does, <laughs> yes. Let's get on to our big moments about the episode. We must face the ramifications of the Prime Directive. John, what's your major moment? It is, I suppose, the big moment of of the episode. Um, mm. And it's kind of a two-parter, really. It's Soji's dream that we see at the start 
And then also the Jalmak, uh, the Romulan meditation where Narek gets Soji to tease out this dream that we see at the start in order to get more information, mm-hmm. um, where she's doing it consciously, uh, effectively. I thought this was really, really good. But one of the first things I want to say uh, about it is just that opening with the young Soji uh, sort of coming down the corridor with the lightning it was very horror esque. Mm-hmm. Um, it really did delve uh, and connect with that trope. But also, what we learn from the Jal Mac um, is this kind of modern day Frankenstein. And I, I kind of really like that just because Harry Treadaway um, playing Narek is, is part of that because here is a Penny Dreadful um, connection mm-hmm. where, you know, he is Victor Frankenstein in, um, in Penny Dreadful. Yeah. So I thought that was quite nice that, you know, th- this is an allegory, I suppose, of a modern day Frankenstein here with Soji. Mm-hmm. This, um, this creation, um, you know, her father, uh, being this scientist effectively creating a, a new life form, mm-hmm. if you will. Um, so I thought this was really nicely done. It That's really did true, invoke yeah. the Mary Shelley element with the lightning as yeah, well yeah. that, that, sort of help spark uh, life into the world. So I thought this was a really nice little touch in in the episode, actually, Mm -hmm, Definitely, um, to be honest. Uh, But also, I think the really good thing in this in this moment and and particularly around this Romulan meditation and and the way Narek uh, uses and exploits um, soji really you know he he has been he's had this kind of uh romance with her um a, a fairly secretive one um given he's a romulan but but one where there's been a little playful patter to and fro between uh soji and him about how he is this closed book yet they are and um, drawn to one another at least soji thinks so you know she is unaware of his true intentions and mm-hmm. um, but I, I like that he he connects in to this dream that she tells him about and finds this a, a, a fissure in which to exploit and uh manages to get his his sister on board who does have a really nice moment uh where um, he he's saying he's making progress now that he he knows this weakness that he can exploit, and she just goes progress. Well, you are admirably concealing it. Um, you know, mm-hmm. <laughs> she is absolutely a doubter of his method. Yeah. But here in this episode, his method does come to fruition for them as he walks her through the the Jalmac meditation tradition, uh, as he going and walking through different points within this meditation journey um, and teasing out the dream that Soji has. Uh, And he's asking her to look around and, and ultimately she is giving them at least clues to the location of this synth homeworld, Mm. which both Narek and Narissa realize is a reality. And, you know, for Soji as well as for Daj, they, assumed they were just sisters, biological sisters. They didn't even know that they were synths. But also, it's a question of whether we have thought these are just two um, unique twins uh, Mm -hmm. in the universe, in the galaxy, um, or whether there are more. And I think this is one of the things. Chris did say, you know, he's expecting that moment where there are almost a bit like the Clone Wars in Star Wars, where Mm -hmm. there's just, you know, hundreds of thousands of uh, Soji and Darjas um, on this synth homeworld. And actually... What we're beginning to understand now in this series is that there is a synth homeworld for a start, mm. and there is likely to be uh, countless twins um, on this homeworld. There and might be. yeah, I just I, I just don't know how it's going to play out. You know, it'd be really interesting if their if their entire planet is filled with the synths, wouldn't it? You know, if that's what ha- what was happening with Bruce Maddox, he was building them, and then they went on to build more, or he had a team building more and more and more of them. You know, because the whole thing in in Star Trek originally was that they created data and they created lore and then there was B4, the three versions of data effectively, but they were all massively different and only one was perfect, which was data. And the idea here is that we have Soji and her sister Daj, who are both perfect creations of each other. They're twins, they're exactly alike. 
And w- will they possibly also have been able to mass produce these twins as well? You know, is there something that allowed them to mass produce them? And is that what the whole home world is full of? Or are they just saying the synth home world is just the place where the two of them are from? It seems like Narek and Narissa believe there's a whole legion of them yeah. that need to be destroyed. But we've still only heard about the two of them. One's already dead. So Yeah, and it could be much more kind of naturally evolving yeah. whereby... Um, yes, it's not that there's legions of, of synths, but actually it's just communities and town. They're, bi- they are building their own society Maybe. and civilization. Uh, certainly Narek and Narissa believe that they are a threat and that there is some kind of uh, maybe more existential threat to biological organisms mm-hmm. from this homeworld. And here we get um, two very good moments uh, as Narek takes her around the Jalmak. Uh, one is um, he asks her to look up and we see two red moons and the, the lightning from her dream are these electrical storms, which are immediately fed back to Nerissa, who has the, this, this meditation space, I suppose this, the spiritual place of the Romulan Empire, uh, bugged effectively. Or it's through an earpiece or, or something in, in his ear and her ear. Uh, the one thing I like about this as well is that, you know, um, I don't know, maybe they're not desecrating this spiritual place, but I think they are because the Romulan God doesn't want to let a non-Romulan into yeah. the the kind of chapel or this spiritual space. And so I, I like that sort of disconnect that, you know, on the one hand, there's this Romulan purity, yet the Romulans will uh, desecrate or infiltrate that space in non-spiritual ways to, to get the information. Um, and, and we see then uh, this clue to the synth homeworld with these two red moons and, and the electrical storms. But also then we see this um, striking image of a, a, a wooden mannequin doll almost. Mm-hmm. Um, it, it almost looks like one of um, those, those wooden dolls, that abstract wooden doll that, that's put together, um, but just a, a larger version of, of those oh the um, one that's used for painting that, yes that, that, that kind of use it to model the joints and that kind of stuff exactly yes, I yeah you, I you. and I, uh, I, I instantly what pops into your head is this is an allegory or a, or a an idea because it's coming from her mind it's in her dream this isn't really what young soji would have seen of course because there was no such thing as a young soji as we know now um she's seeing something like Pinocchio being brought to life exactly the, the doll that became a real boy she is the same thing effectively is what her true subconscious is telling her you know yeah so Um, we see this doll but it and it has her face it is quite lifelike so everything else looks you know you see the grain of the wood it looks very much like that pinocchio kind of doll that is created except the face uh very much has the the look of soji and daj uh on it i wonder are there some people that watch the episode and and thought did they just put some skin on some wood is that what this is like? <laughs> i wonder is anybody confused that this is all in her mind is it a dream you know it's um, the template effectively for for the body yeah in terms of that artistic way as you say it, yeah. you know again it, it's another pointer yeah so, but it's all just in her mind this is yeah. her mind telling her you're not real um you are a doll come to life effectively uh, but yeah Narek is so manipulative in here and it I, it does make me wonder you know by the end of this discussion when he effectively goes right that's it see you later have a good life and then tries to poison her and kill her um it does make me wonder are they going to play it that he does have feelings for her because or is he using her feelings for him to manipulate her like he did in the episode specifically where he talks about his real name for example does he give that to her as his final piece to get her to open up and give him the information and then leaves? Or will we see him come back in future and effectively because he is in love with her to save her in that situation in the future, potentially? Well, I I think that's it. I mean, it's almost like he does a anti-Indiana Jones moment where as he leaves her, he gives her a long kiss. It is that moment where Indiana Jones is being ripped away from Marion and that they're still trying to embrace one another mm. uh, because of that positive connection. Here, it's, it's just that it, it's, it's a more dispassionate, it feels anti Indiana Jones effectively as he leaves. And I think and again, it, he takes his final kiss and then goes, 
you're not real. Yeah, you never exactly. Wear. Um, and and this <laughs> is the other big thing is you know Narek really does show his true self, both in terms of his his real name, his, his private name, or is this really the one name that he gives to the person who he loves in terms of Hurayan, and it's also his deceptiveness and manipulation of her. I mean, maybe the kiss is just simply to keep her sort of. Um, calm and to prevent her from activating mm -hmm. as as they say but also he shows his true self by you know unleashing his deadly romulan rubik's cube with and it's not poison it's radiation it's radiation because i was wondering um what type of gas this was going to be in order to kill a synthetic because yep. presumably a poison um or an acid or something like that wouldn't be able to um, destroy them. But yeah. it seems as though it was radiation because as she's trying to escape from the situation, she's sort of battering through the, the floor, um, you know, they can't actually then go in to um, stop her That's because right. the radiation has already been released yeah. from this uh, Rubik's Cube. Yeah, because I think we saw in First Contact, I think it was, where we had Data going into the Borg Cube, an area that, that was irradiated, and you see his outer skin kind of falling off um, because he's in contact with it. But his his android body isn't affected by uh, the radiation so uh, if, if i remember rightly that was in in first contact so uh, so we know if they're built the same way or very similarly which we don't know for definite but they must be very close to data um if they're built the same way they probably have a, a high tolerance for any of that kind of stuff as well so uh, it was really interesting and again you wonder this idea was brought to narek from soji saying you have your name for outsiders you have your name for family and you have the name that you only share with the one you love he shares his name with her and he's supposed to only share that to the person he's given his heart to, but is he sharing it with her as his final manipulation to her? We just don't know right now. I feel, because of the trajectory of the show, I feel we may have that reconfirmed at a later stage that Narek is in love with Soji, and he goes to save her from Nerissa, possibly, uh, over everybody else, something like that. I think that might happen in the future, but I think it's left here as... I've now accomplished my mission. I now have to kill your entire species, effectively, of, of synths. Um, and goodbye. You were never real. Off yeah. I go. No, absolutely. So. I think just finally for me on this, there was a really nice moment, uh, during the Jal Mac, um, where Narek is just behind Soji looking over her shoulder and his face is slightly in darkness. A really nice shot. Uh, just kind of, you know, in that moment, you, just understand this this man in the shadows manipulating this this woman in front mm -hmm. of him it was yeah. really really good shot definitely definitely i like the jean Mac setup as well like the idea of walking an actual path in a room as you're going through exploring a particular memory or a particular dream i don't know how often you'd use it but i, but I like the idea of walking through a memory or walking through an idea uh, i thought that was really cool um I also had to make, have to make a comment about this when Soji's standing at the beginning of the line and the room is effectively just some markings on the floor and some lights as she walks in and she goes, this is beautiful. And all I, all I could think of was, well, she is an android, I suppose, and it looks, <laughs> it looks very well laid out. So maybe in her mind, she's like, well, that's quite beautiful because it's all ones and zeros. <laughs> it's kind of like, yeah, it, well, it was very simple, yeah. wasn't it? Um, th it's like this... not, not many people would comment on a room without any kind of, plants or decorations or anything like that in the room and go this is beautiful it yeah i mean it was play. simple sparse this this meditative space yeah. which i suppose is the key to it exactly um to not provide any distraction but yeah. derek without further distraction <laughs> what is your prime directive well i'm gonna argue with you and say the big moment of the episode is my one because <laughs> the big moment of the episode is hugh and picard reuniting uh, so cute i know i've been waiting for this for ages because i really like the character of hugh when we saw him for that quick moment a couple of episodes ago when he was talking to soji um it wasn't it didn't feel like enough because he was such a massive character from uh the history of of the next generation to come back for this show and only come back for that one or two episodes it was just great to have a moment where he reunites with Picard. Um, I love all the way through from that original uh, moment where Picard is searching the computer and it reveals what Hugh used to look like with his Borg implants on screen. And you see the recollection from Picard right up to that moment where he's stumbling on the Borg cube and Hugh comes up and picks him up, helps him out. 
and says to him, I'm here and I will do absolutely anything I can. I don't even know why you're here, but I'll do anything I can to help you. And Picard says to him, well, I need what I need right now is a friendly face. And they embrace and have that have that lovely, friendly hug. It really does feel like the two of them have been reunited over all of this time that they've spent apart. You know, um, they really do seem to have a good relationship between the two of them. And I think it works so well in the episode that I really enjoyed their scenes together. They um, they're playing off each other because they both have this past because they were both former Borg. Um, they both have this past that they can completely rely on each other to have those discussions he's not as broken almost as seven is because seven's seen the brutality uh to the former borg i know hugh has as well but he seems to be kind of going well at least i'm making a difference and at least at least when the other xbs are coming out of being borg i'm able to be the one there and go right, we can move on together. You know, he's kind of leading them into this new life. And Picard being so impressed with the actual reclamation operation for the Borg saying, you know, I didn't think this could happen on such a mass scale, you know. Um, I think to everybody else, and I like these moments when they're walking around the corridors, to everybody else when they see the ex-Borg, they're confused by them a bit. It seemed like the way Hugh's explaining it, he's kind of saying, but every time they see them, everybody else is looking at them as their former Borg Whereas you and me, we can look at them as they're coming back to the way they used to be uh, rather than being ex-Borg. So you see that moment when Picard comes on board first and is walking down the corridor with Hugh and he tries to avert his eyes so that someone doesn't recognize him as Locutus, one of the former Borg, so that he doesn't recognize him as Locutus of Borg because that's the memory they all have of each other. They know what they were and what and what part of the Borg they formed. So I, I like that relationship between the two of them, I like the connection between the two of them. Also, really good touch when, again, when Picard is kind of collapsing from his arrival on the cube and the camera pans down through the ship. It's a cool shot, actually. Uh, after those clips from First Contact, I think they used the First Contact um movie as their template for all the Borg and, and Borg Queen stuff. Uh, and then the camera pans down to a bold uh, Borg who looks very like a younger Picard, almost a little, a little heavier than than Sir Patrick Stewart, but it looks like another Lacutus is on board the ship. It's a nice touch to choose him out of all of the board that could be there. You know, um, oh, he is the cutest of board. <laughs> the cutest of board. I think I heard that on another <laughs> podcast. I can't remember who said it, but the cutest of board. It's definitely my favorite, uh, my favorite um, nickname for Lacutus. Uh, but yeah, I just wanted to talk about their reunion. It's uh, it's it stuck out to me as being such a great moment because you know Picard remember he's surrounded by so many characters that we've never met before so him actually yeah. meeting someone he didn't he never even knew seven remember he he would never have spent any time with seven of nine whereas that's true Hugh would have been someone from his old days on uh on the enterprise that he knew and had a relationship with had a friendship with in some in some sense so seeing that he's doing well and seeing that he's getting on well and as a leader here you know we have that moment where Hugh says uh -huh. at least I'm here on behalf of the federation so I can get off here and leave I'm not employed as such by the Romulans which was know? a nice thing to come out of that conversation because I was I had thought that he was employed by the Romulans that he had kind of moved to the Romulans because of his treatment maybe within the Federation mm. um, and I, I didn't actually think that this was going to be I think I said it on a previous podcast it it felt to me as though that this wasn't going to be maybe a happy reunion so mm. uh, likewise I'm really really happy that Huey and Picard uh, <laughs> came together like this I, I really like um, the episode in The Next Generation with Hugh um, aka Huey and uh, <laughs> I, I just thought it was a really tender uh, episode, I think, yeah. from Jean-Luc Picard to someone else. Mm -hmm. um, and this someone else happened to be, you know, this monster for the rest of the Federation, which was the Borg. Yeah. Uh, and he looked through that. So, you know, it's quite powerful, their relationship. Yeah. Um, and certainly for me. Um, yeah, Absolutely. And I don't care how many times you say it, John, it's never going to become a thing that the character's called Huey. He's never called Huey. Huey. <laughs> you Huey. Say it, you've said it for Huey. every episode for the last six. It's not going to become Huey. a thing. Huey. <laughs> well, fellow Trekkers, please uh, go over onto our Facebook group and, of course, just <laughs> comment Huey. Huey, Huey, Huey. Right. Okay. Uh, I think Let's that's it. prove Derek wrong. <laughs> Even Exborg can have... a. Uh, a nickname of course they can absolutely not huey i think i'm going to actually be bridging here from the prime directive to the omega directive 
implement the Omega Directive immediately. So, and the reason why is it my, my medium moment is kind of linked in with Hugh and Picard reuniting, as mm-hmm. you say. Um, and that's because I think um, Patrick Stewart here amazingly portrays the anxiety and concern uh, that he has in returning to a, a, a Borg cube here. Absolutely. You know, he's very wary on board the ship, La Serena, you know, he, he does say, um, they don't change, they masticize. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, it, he's haunted by something, uh, that he wants to forget. Um, and that's, that's something that Rios says. And importantly, he then just does a throwaway line to, uh, Dr. Jurati, where he says, like you, Dr. Jurati, which I thought was really kind of a, a, a nice, uh, moment of, um, perception by Rios that she does seem haunted as well, and mm-hmm. certainly after the events of the last episode. That now that's for me. That's just an aside. Yeah. But um, you know, we, we go uh, from this. It, Picard is massively anxious as he he comes um, on board the the Borg cube. First mm-hmm. of all, he's brought to us a place where he is not greeted. It's like the Romulans are trying to make it as difficult as possible for him. It's kind of in this empty space with no formal um uh sort of welcome party yeah. in any way um and he's getting these flashes back to the collective um and so on and you know as you were talking about before the the bug that stop him um from falling he has to be told this by Hugh. He, yeah. he has to have this explained. He thinks they're starting to swarm him, almost to take him off again to, you know, reconnect him into the collective yeah. and to start applying all the um, the nuts, bolts, and, and so on yeah. that that will turn him into a Borg. So I I, I really like this, and I, and I like that you know as Hugh and Picard hug. Um, he does say, I'll take a friendly face. And it's like Hugh just gives him that settle, settled nature now that he's uh, on board um, the the Borg cube. Yeah. Uh, but I, I just thought that anxiety, that wariness from Jean-Luc was really, really good yeah. uh, here. Um, I also do like... Um, Prior to him arriving, um, it is another fantastic shot, um, which is where, you know, he, he's on his computer searching oh, yeah. for artifact, the treaty, the Borg, uh, and, and all of this. And there is that image of the Cusius of Borg, uh, there and just imposed, uh, through this, 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 um, through screen is Jean-Luc Picard. Um, it's such a powerful way of reconnecting these two identities uh, in a very clever shot, yep. um, I think, from the director. Absolutely. I love how um, how Picard's hand is going to his face where that, uh, that implant was in the past and just touching his face to kind of almost kind of going, is it still there? You know, I can still feel it yeah, exactly. on my face when I see that image of it's myself. It's really interesting, yeah. isn't it? I have to say, I did have to look up um, his his <laughs> word where that he used, where he says the board coolly assimilates entire systems. They metastasize. I have to look up what that word meant because I didn't recognize it. It's effectively saying that um, it's a cancer, that the Borg infect everything they come in contact with. They can't change. That's all they do is just assimilate and take over. Yeah, they and ruin the entire system. They infect and change the mm-hmm. original cell to something different yeah um yeah absolutely i I think as well um not only is is picard reassured by the friendly face of of hugh but i actually think as you're saying you know the work that hugh is doing here helps to put picard's mind at ease you know he he says hugh you're doing good uh you're showing that Borg are victims and not monsters. And that must also for him personally be something reassuring or dare I say it comforting that he's like, um, I'm not a monster. I was a victim of the Borg assimilation yeah, and, and how, yeah. yeah. So I, I thought that was a, another nice moment mm-hmm. uh, within, within this episode. Absolutely. Uh, my Omega director is actually quite a short one because it's only really one scene, but it's Rafi's lies to get Picard as diplomatic pass because what we've seen from Rafi is that she's fallen to a massively low level. She has gone to a deep place where everybody left her behind, but she's still willing on the encouragement, I suppose, of Picard and the rest of the crew, she's still willing to burn another bridge 
to accomplish Picard's mission for him almost. Um, she gets the diplomatic credentials from uh, her this Captain Emmy, a friend of hers, uh, who ends the conversation with her effectively saying, as a very close friend of yours, never contact me again, you know? Um, and you see it from Rafi, you see it on her face that this is another thing that she's had to burn because of her relationship with Picard. What I like about the scene as well, though, is Elnor in the background seeing Rafi <laughs> say yeah. all these lies. He just has this look on his face kind of going, could we not have done this without all of the lies? Well, <laughs> absolutely, yeah. This is not how I conduct myself. I would tell them the truth, tell them what I want, and if they don't give it to me, maybe I'd cut off a few heads. <laughs> it <laughs> was. I I really like that. There's this kind of bewildered expression mm-hmm. from Elnor. What what what's happening here? Why are you doing this this lying thing again? But there's also another little nod to Rios, who's smirking, yeah. who's who's just really enjoying seeing Raffi at the height of her sort of hustler power i suppose mm-hmm. in that sense that she's able to extract this diplomatic credential from effectively her former friend and i i think that's it that's what's great about this this scene here of raffi doing this is that i find myself sort of smiling all the way through it just mm-hmm. going good on you girl um it was really good i i like these touches of looking at elnor at rios um even raffi's kind of you know sort of take on on Jean-Luc Picard where she's going you know he's so federation his face is probably still on the brochures Mm -hmm. uh, all of this kind of thing and and you know what he's like he's uh when he's when he's not id he's just 90 percent ego yeah exactly (laughs) i love the face on on uh, sir patrick stewart when he's looking at it kind of going well i'm not that bad i (laughs) I know it's it it, and so it's actually a really kind of light piece but underpinning it is this tinge that she's lost another friend here you know the previous episode she lost um or effectively wasn't able to reconnect with her son Mm -hmm. who really doesn't want anything to do with her we know she's lost her her um her job within starfleet because of what happened with the synth attack on mars uh, and so on and what went down there yeah. back on earth in starfleet as yeah. uh, as picard uh, resigns yeah. and of course we see her drinking heavily here and mm-hmm. um, now in other podcasts i would normally do a whiskey watch uh certainly for jessica jones because yeah. she was a another person that did like um a good old whiskey it certainly looks like whiskey uh, but there is no label so mm-hmm. it is an unbranded whiskey watch in that sense but you know this all kind of just underlines or underscores this whole kind of relatively light-hearted piece with mm. kind of that tinge of raffi circling downwards ever further well, a yeah. bit. well i think this would be a very good example of the functional alcoholic right so this is someone that can hold herself together to get a specific job done but you see almost instantly afterwards and some people might think it's badly played because instantly she starts to fall over and stumble um as she's drunk remember like she starts the scene going get out of my face let me just do what i need to do it's only three minutes that she has to keep herself together and make herself look like she's not drunk effectively and then the minute that's over she kind of takes another swig of whiskey and falls over afterwards that's a functional alcoholic and unfortunately i have experienced that in my life i've met people like this who are able to hold themselves together and you wouldn't realize that underneath it all they've been taking swigs of whiskey out of their desk kind of thing you know yeah so there are people like that and i do think this moment is is showing you how how tough it is or how tough she can be when she needs to be actually and then her returning to herself because the rest of the episode on raffi's side really is taken up with her mourning the fact that she's not only lost her son but now lost a granddaughter that she can that she's not allowed to meet so she's back in the spiral again realizing that she now has a granddaughter that she can't meet she has a son that no longer wants to see us and she's saying to rios you've known me this long you didn't even know had a son and now he has a a daughter of his own on the way and no one will ever know and yeah. I'll never be able to meet her. It was a really sad moment that I thought it was really nicely played, uh, to be honest, mm-hmm. um, for sure. And she also, you know, again, in that moment, you know, um, realizes why are Narek and Narissa keeping Soji, this other synth, alive? You know, she starts logically processing why would they not kill her instantly why are they keeping her around what is it that they need from her Mm -hmm. why they're doing this um which i think is quite good as well you know because um i i think raffi she is that 
as you say, functioning alcoholic who is massively intelligent and certainly is an expert in all things Romulan. Mm-hmm. So um, you can and you can see her um, her her intelligence around this area just really shining through. I really liked it. So I think she realizes that you know there must be something else. Uh, in the equation here for the Romulans. Mm-hmm. It's not um, simply about trying to destroy these two twins. There's something else. And I don't think we... we she just certainly doesn't come to any conclusion here, but I just like her intelligence around around this. Even in these low moments, she's constantly thinking. Yeah. She, um, you know, trying to play the, the chessboard in a way. Uh, mm-hmm. I really like that. I think the other thing I liked about this is that, you know, in terms of how they were going to get into this Borg cube, Dr. Jurati was saying she could pose as a scientist. There were kind of maybe more uh, covert ways that they were thinking about doing it. And, and you know, Rios is asking Captain Picard, because you've got a plan. And, it, and you know, even with Rafi's lying to her friend to get these credentials for Picard, Ultimately, it's the Kuat Malat way that we must be open about this. We need to be mm. above board. Yeah. Otherwise, it's going to uh, be uh, doomed to failure. Exactly. So I, I like that as well. Yeah. And remember, Rios is actually criticizing Picard. He's criticizing his, exactly. his hubris again, I suppose, is, is something that's been leveled at Picard since the beginning of this series. But you have Rios kind of going, oh, well, we've crossed the former Romulan uh, neutral zone and we're now in Romulan territory. <laughs> and the only reason I'm doing this, the only reason I'm happy about doing this is because you've got a plan, don't you, Picard? And you see, you see Picard's face just kind of, well, I was coming up with one. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> I had an idea about one. Um, yeah, just really good moments with those characters in there. That's kind of it for our second points. Let's get on to our final section. Make it so, number one. The small moment about the episode. John, what's yours? Well, do you know... Um, I got a bit nostalgic here because the next generation, you know, always gave us nerds hope. <laughs> uh, certainly, uh, myself for myself. Mm-hmm. Um, and in this episode, it is no different. Uh, where the geek girl, in this case, Dr. Jurati, gets the hot bloke, um, <laughs> Rios. Yes. Uh, good on you, Dr. Jurati. Uh-huh. Uh, a bit of a snog there, a bit of uh, quarters action, no quarter given, mm-hmm. I suppose, uh, no quarter <laughs> taken, but maybe quite a bit. Maybe. So if quarters her... taken and given all around there in the go. quarters uh, between these two. Yes, um, it'll keep her occupied for a few hours, as she says. <laughs> you know, it, it always gave us this hope that we could dream, um, you know, uh, us nerds. And mm-hmm. I, I think it's, it's, it's providing that inspiration again, that the, <laughs> the, the, the nerdy girl can get the hot bloke. Or just the um, shirtless football playing captain. Yeah, yeah, or the, you know, the nerdy boy can get the hot girl or the hot bloke yeah. and vice versa. Yeah. You know, it's all really, really good, but a little bit more serious uh, now. As I say, um, th- there's two moments here with Rios saying um, to to Doctor Jurati, um, you know, that you look haunted too. That there's something that you want to forget. There's something in your past, whatever it might be, that you would like to forget. As he had just said to Picard, and, and he picks that out from Doctor Jurati, uh, and I, I think as well. In this moment, is it that she's manipulating him mm. uh, here? Uh, because it it it's almost feels like she is trying to close him down uh, from sort of prying into her private life as 100%, well. So, yeah. um, you know, I still think that Dr. Jurati is an evil Romulan spy <laughs> and uh, she cannot be trusted. I might be going a bit too far there, yes. but nonetheless, I think... Whatever has been shown to her has completely wrecked her. Mm. Um, and she is suffering for that. And um, to what extent now will she go on to try and sabotage everything around this, this mission wow. uh, of Picard's to try and protect Soji? And I'm sure she will because I think the thing to bear in mind here is that Soji, the dark destroyer, um, is still alive. She is with Picard and is probably soon to be uh, aboard La Serena when they rendezvous. Interesting. Yeah, I won. I, I just assumed that for Doctor Gerardi, her mission was to stop Bruce Maddox from continuing, 
on his work. Her mission was to make up for the things that she thought she'd done wrong in the past in helping in the creation of Soji. But you could be right. Maybe she is tasked with also helping the Romulans taking out uh, Soji and, and the rest of her species, as we're going to be calling them, until we until we know is there more of them or not. Um, well, like I'm, I'm just not sure whether Gerardi has anything further um, to play as part of her mission from uh, Commodore O that she got earlier on in the season, because we never saw what she was actually told to do. No, that's true. Um, so was she just there to make sure that they didn't take Bruce Maddox home and allow him to set back up his work or anything like that? Um, she does seem massively haunted. She seems massively perturbed by the fact that she did kill uh, Maddox, but she's covering it up completely, saying he died of natural causes. So... Um, so I, I don't I just don't know what the next step is. Is she going to just become a, a member of the crew from now on and go along with everything that Picard's doing? Um, or is that the reason why she wanted to go down with them to the board cube to potentially do the same thing that she'd done to Maddox, kill Soji? Uh, was that was that what she was trying to do with going down there saying the plan that she'd come up with was use her credentials as a doctor to get them aboard the board ship that she was one of the first people that came up with an idea yeah. of what to do so was this her plan all along you know so it's it's interesting i'm in, I'm intrigued to see what she does in the future but yeah that definitely felt like that moment with rios where uh he starts prying a bit too deep and then she plants a kiss on his lips to go kind of shut the hell up and <laughs> stop prying into my business <laughs> in a yeah. way but she still you know is kind of saying right we can we can go off and we you can take my mind off everything that i've gone through um but i i, I do like the moment for my number one, my final moment, um, I just wanted to kind of question this because it's something that popped into my head when we were watching this episode. In last week's episode where we had the whole storyline of Seven, um, there was the other part of it where Bejazel and her team were harvesting Borg parts to sell on the black market, I guess. Is the Romulan reclamation project, are they also harvesting the Borg implants? under the auspices that they're um, saving the XBs? Do you know what I mean? Like, is there some connection between those two stories? Are the Romulans actually going, we're going to take all these pieces out of you and cure you and bring you back to being humans? You know, they're treating them well. They're treating them far better than Bejazel and her team, which were taking out all of these implants. We, we said we wouldn't say that I name know. again, Derek. <laughs> it, it caused us so much strife. It took me an extra hour yeah. to edit the episode last week, but I had to mention her name so I, you knew who I was talking about. I but, think we should just call her Bejazel. Or Jay, I think is or what. Bejesus. Yeah. <laughs> or Bejazel. Or Jay. As, uh, as Seven had called her in the episode um, we could just call her that we can't call her BJ <laughs> no we cannot no we definitely cannot um, but I just wondered whether the Romulans are harvesting the Borg parts um, yes they're using um, anesthetic to make sure that they're not as damaged I suppose as the people that uh, that Jay was taking all of the uh, implants out of but are they actually harvesting them? Is this what's going to connect to Seven's story? Is Seven going to arrive and go, hang on a second, what are you doing with all the bits you're taking out of these XBs? You know? <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, they're certainly probably not going to dump that technology, are they? Mm. I mean, that's the thing. It, it, it seems like the sort of more palatable or, or legal way of doing it just under, as you say, the auspices of this treaty. Mm. Um, but they're certainly... Um, you know, I suppose at least they're being green that they're reuse, recycle kind of thing. <laughs> um, oh, oh, yes. Are they just melting it down? Or, you know, are they trying to, um, sort of strip the technology in order to learn about the technology and then develop it for their own needs? You know, it's almost this back engineering of the Borg tech. So, um, it's really good, but it's. I think it's also a nice way that Seven's story could reconnect here, Maybe. in that she sees the contradiction of what Bejazel did and what the Romulans are doing, um, that there really is no difference, yeah. um, other than at least um, that they're they're treating the the former Borg um, sort of humanely in that sense, or Romulanely in that sense. <laughs> there you go. There you go. Well, Hugh's, Hugh is human, so maybe humanely is okay. Um, I just, it just popped into my head for this episode. I want to make sure that I put it in the podcast here. So we actually discussed it. So, uh, so I just wonder, uh, is there something there that might come back and be connected to Seven's story with the Romulans and that how she comes back in, uh, to the show in the future? Um, just wondered if that was something. Speaking of something, is there anything else we want to talk about for the episode? Isn't there something else you have to do? And Easter eggs, connections that you may have noticed, John? Um, the one thing I did notice was that Rios's shoulder wound that we saw um, 
in episode three where, you know, he didn't want it to be um, sort of wiped away. Mm -hmm. You know, he didn't want it um, to be modern federation scienced away um like it could have been he wanted that wound yeah. um and durable it, regenerator whatever yeah it's called, right? he um but he didn't have it on his shoulder it is yeah. completely gone when he's playing the shirtless football so mm-hmm. it's a little continuity mistake me think or is it or another is it? underlining of the fact that he may be a hologram exactly yeah. but there are other scars still there but maybe mm-hmm. they were the ones that were already present when he um became a hologram yeah. in that sense or the the template from his body that was used so yeah, yeah i know it, you were looking very closely at yeah that scene to i sure i was and check and um, see if that i don't know there. why at all um <laughs> why i was looking at this topless uh hunk um around his defined shoulder area at just all. to see just to it see was if, if it was all was for continuity uh, and podcasting <laughs> exactly right. um so but that, that was just one of the kind of things uh, here as well and also we get to see the 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 borg queen's antechamber here hugh takes once the alarm has been raised jean-luc and soji have connected the uh you know it, it is very terminator-esque in like give me your hand um i'll help you yeah. <laughs> <laughs> except that's not what uh, was said give no. me your hand if you want to live you know come uh, with me come with me if you want to live yes okay grant so i completely uh butchers uh the quote from terminator <laughs> yeah, it was only in seven movies <laughs> over and over again john yeah. but um you know i i like that hugh it is opening up the secret doorways and passageways to get to the queen's uh, the Borg Queen's mm-hmm. antechamber, um, and we we have this this technology here for uh, Soji and for uh, Jean Luc to escape yeah. from the oncoming Romulans. I think that technology was out of uh, Star Trek Voyager. It just rem- reminds me of something because the whole premise of the TV show Voyager was that they had been sent out of the main quadrant where Starfleet is sent out to the Delta quadrant and stuck there and couldn't find a way back. And I feel like this technology that transports somebody across a galaxy, it feels like that was something from Star Trek Voyager. So this was, I think Hugh describes it as something after uh, Picard's time on the Enterprise or after the time that he knew Picard on the Enterprise, this technology was absorbed by the Borg, this this uh, ability for the Borg Queen to escape any situation, she could just walk into this and get transferred, what, to 10 million light years across the galaxy? Yeah, it was something like 40,000 light years. 40,000 light yeah. years, 10 million light years, I don't know how far that is. Uh, quite far, I would say. Um, but, but I think it's something that I remember from the back of my mind from Voyager, so just a little, a, a little reference that the species that the Voyager team would have met and tried to convince to help them on that show got absorbed by the Borg, effectively, and their technology got absorbed. And also nice references to the idea of the Borg being a collective. I like the idea that both Hugh and uh, Picard know where the, the Queen's lair is effectively even though neither of them have been inside it they both know where it is because they were part of the collective and the collective knows everything about the collective you know yeah uh, even that reference to the borg that walks past and kind of goes oh the cutest because <laughs> <laughs> that, that was really good <laughs> even actually. though you know it doesn't look the same they know exactly who they are from just walking past each other so. yeah it's interesting actually because even though it was elnor to the rescue mm-hmm. uh in this sense there was part of me wondering whether you know because we'd have that image at the start of one of the borg from uh his little pod kind of looking up when jean-luc came aboard mm-hmm. whether it would actually be um the Borg that are still on the ship coming to protect Lucius of Borg mm-hmm. and and Hugh as yeah, well. Maybe, maybe, yeah. La <laughs> Hugh of Borg? <laughs> no, not really, no. I think he Huey was, of Borg. No, no, definitely not. I think he was three of six or something was his, his actual designation. He used the name he chose. Um, That's true. But I've actually said it on the show before and had it written down before, so I, I didn't write it down this time. But anyway... Um, just nice references, as I say, to, to those uh, those concepts of them all being collective. We still don't know what's happened to the Borg that haven't been reclaimed, the, that haven't become XBs. They say there's areas of the Borg cube you're not able to go into. Will that come to play? Please let it come to play. Somebody walks off path, ends off being uh, absorbed into a Borg collective that's been uh, disconnected from the main collective. You know, there are supposed to be areas of this ship that are unsafe. 
we haven't seen them yet, but I'd love to have a little moment of that. Uh, one other reference that I saw in the episode, or I noticed in the episode, just Rios and Rafi uh, talking about the bet that they had, that they had bet two strips of latinum uh, on the fact that Soji would be dead. <laughs> I love that idea that they went on this mission, or Rios went on this mission, thinking that the target of that Picard wanted to say was going to be dead when they arrived. <laughs> I like that little gag in there. But they're saying that they bet two strips of latinum. Latinum was the currency of the Ferengi. Um, Quark was mentioned before in the series. Uh, this is something that was mentioned a lot on DS9, this idea of betting on things using latinum. So uh, so I like that they are still using that form of currency. Uh, if you're no longer, if you're not a member of the Federation, you need some kind of currency, I suppose. So, uh, so I like that they mentioned that in the episode. That's all the uh, things I noticed in the episode, John. Anything else that you saw or anything else you, you wanted to talk about? I think that's all from, from me, um, to be honest. Yeah. I, I did like the reference to Romulans being in a 250 year bad mood. Yeah, <laughs> that, that the, was very cool. Captain actually. Emmy, that was yeah. quite, a, quite a good little gag about them always being in a bad mood. <laughs> well, that's it, I guess, for the episode. John, what did you think of it overall? Star Trek Picard episode six. What do you think of it? I, I love this episode. I, I actually uh, think it's the best. Uh, episode so far right. and i give this five radiative romulan rubik's cubes out of five um i nice. thought it was i just thought it, it really pulled a lot of threads together here mm-hmm. you know we finally get soji and picard meeting up and i i love this this moment where she's dazed confused you know she's just been betrayed by narek um and, and i think the moment of, of jean-luc picard saying you know come with me trust me trust me i think Patrick Stewart just played it so well. Um, not only the meeting of Soji and, and Jean-Luc, but also Hugh and, and Jean-Luc meeting mm-hmm. again, I thought was really good. And I, I, I think how both of them deal with being former members of the collective um, and uh, Borgs it is just really nicely done here. Definitely. And again, I think Rafi's downward spiral, that there's so much here that I really like. Uh, you know, the Jalmac... Um, meditation tradition and um, and how that was done with Nayak was just so so good so for me i thought this just has lots of great moments that really propelled the storyline forward mm-hmm. uh covered uh, aspects um from the the previous five episodes as well um and i'm finding this a really nice romp through um the galaxy here with, with uh, jean-luc picard mm-hmm. uh, i'm really enjoying it you know, th- there's lots of um, stuff to come here, but certainly I suspect we will be traveling to a planet that's got two red moons and electrical storms very, very soon. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, absolutely. Um, really strong, really great episode here with five radiative Romulan Rubik's Cubes out of five. And fellow Trekkies and Trekkers, John said that twice in one go. Yeah? Yes. You didn't have to get that repeated. I'm very impressed with your little Romulan tongue twist twister there. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Uh, next week, she sells seashells on the seashore. I, I knew you couldn't say uh, that. No, I can't do that one. <laughs> I almost sounded like Raffi there after her bottle of whiskey, dare I say it. <laughs> Derek, what did you think of episode six? I really enjoyed this episode. Some great stuff. That impending threat of... Um, what would happen to Picard when he gets to the Borg cube paid off in such a great way, I think, in this episode. You know, finally seeing Picard get so angry about, you know, even the idea that he would be okay going aboard a Borg cube um, and seeing his memories play tricks on his mind almost as he gets on board. You know, the the idea of that a Borg would be awoken just by him arriving on the ship um, all going on in his brain and his mind. I think that those were really, really good moments. Two things I didn't like, because we don't always talk about the things we don't like on the show, <gasps> but two things I didn't like in this episode, I just thought they were weird. The conversation he has with Jurati, where she's explaining that Bruce Maddox died of natural ca- causes. This is the person that he was trying to save and get information from, and Picard just kind of goes, oh, that must have been awful for you. And then moves on and has a completely different conversation as if it doesn't matter at all that Bruce Maddox is dead. That just felt a little weird. Yeah, it's strange, isn't it? I mean, I do know what you mean, but... He's got the information so grand, let's move on. It (laughs) is a kind of a bit like that. And to be honest, it's not to say that Picard isn't... Mourning is too strong a word. You know, he hardly knew this guy uh, in the sense that he had that moment where he is having a legal and existential and philosophical battle in The Next Generation. Generation. Mm-hmm. But Jean Luc Picard does not know this guy. Which is like 28 uh, years ago. Yeah, I suppose, he, yeah, he doesn't know him. It's not that he doesn't feel sad, but 
there isn't necessarily going to be some wallowing grief that he's got to pull himself out of. So I, I don't think it, it's it's maybe more his treatment of Jurati, um in terms of comforting her. But we know that there is this standoffishness about yeah. Jean-Luc Picard. There always has been on The Next Generation. As I say, that's why when I think one of the episodes where he was in bed with Beverly Crusher, I was mm-hmm. just like, uh, hang on a sec, he doesn't do this kind of thing. <laughs> um, and, you know, we've... He's the eternal bachelor, of course. Exactly. And, and we've yeah. seen him with um, with Rafi. So it, I don't expect him to be wallowing and gushing with grief no. over Maddox's um, death. And I think, in a sense, from a pure sort of detached point of view, he has the information that he needs, mm-hmm. which is where Soji is. I, I don't think I even meant I even meant in that way. There was just no investigation into the death of of Bruce Maddox. He kind of goes, oh, he died of natural causes. And he goes, that must have been bad for you, and then moves on. He doesn't even go, are you sure? Maybe we should check the computer logs of the emergency medical hologram that was activated twice, just around the time that he died. Maybe we should check and see if he saw you poisoning or killing um, Bruce Maddox just after he got on board. Um, I just expected it to be a bigger thing in the episode, that was all. So, uh, But that was that was just a bit of a surprise. The other thing that I thought was a little bit odd for the end of the episode was, as we have the hero moment when Elnor comes down and, and effectively murders three Romulans in front of Picard, and Picard goes, thanks for ignoring my instructions and coming down and saving us, and moves on. Whereas last time, when Elnor murdered somebody in front of Picard, he got massively angry about it and berated him and said, don't kill anyone unless I tell you to. So I was wondering why they didn't include him saying something similar again. I told you to stay on board the ship. Thanks for saving us but I still don't watch you killing people Yeah, would have made a bit more sense in the scene. That's all. But overall, the episode was a really good episode. I really enjoyed, I really enjoyed some of the things that happened. And I'm glad we're now propelled off the board cube with Soji and Picard on the run now, effectively. Um, and with the Romulans or the Jat Fash effectively getting the information that they've been looking for since the beginning of this season, this, this piece of information about where, the homeland or home world of the synthesis and wh- where is that going to take the rest of the series so i think we're really lighting up our storyline for the rest of the series so uh, an excellent episode really enjoyed it yeah i mean i think we do need to explore enemies being killed in the federation world or the star trek world because uh, for the sake of brevity i think um the starfleet have never um, solely set their faces to stone. I think people yeah. have died, and I think whilst there is moments where Jean Luc is saying, you know, killing isn't the answer here. In in terms of pure self defense, um, that's not to say that he will have his phases set to stone. To me, it was more, I think, in that scene that he didn't take. Elnor with him and that he seemed to let Elnor go to defend him um, much more but maybe he recognised as well that it would be the only way for Hugh to remain alive Mm -hmm. Okay, a a lot maybe is unsaid in that scene for the sake of brevity uh, within the the, the episode Um, but yeah I mean I I, I kind of understand what you mean um, for sure but I think Romulans bearing down on you, um, the the need to uh, ab- absolutely retain the thing that you've come for in the form of Soji, then um, you can't start having long conversations uh, and moments of no, you shouldn't have done that. That that would have seemed like you know pa- pause action. Let's have this right. philosophical yeah. debate. So yeah, I, I do. Uh, understand what you mean but nonetheless i i didn't have an issue with this so pause action time for philosophical debate you mean the next generation basically basically yes <laughs> that's not a criticism we both love the next generation uh, let's get on to some feedback your thoughts about the previous episodes and this episode um if you want to send in any of your thoughts about the episodes you can email us to feedback at tvpodcastindustries.com or as i mentioned before you can join us on our facebook group at facebook.com slash groups slash tv podcast industries if you want your voice to be on the podcast you can record a clip of yourself over on our website at tvpodcastindustries.com, just like Jacob did. Hey guys, I just wanted to drop y'all a quick note. I am a huge fan of y'all's podcast for Star Trek Picard. I'm a huge Star Trek fan and I love what y'all are doing with this podcast. I just finished watching episode five. I know y'all have probably moved on to recording the podcast for episode six, but I just wanted to drop you a quick note. 
And it's kind of something I was thinking about with Gabriel's wife. You mentioned in the podcast that she was Romulan. I think, in my opinion, she was probably Vulcan. I think, you know, it makes more sense to me that she would be a Vulcan based on his path with his mom. Mm. Psychologically, he would go for somebody that has that more calm, emotionless, stable demeanor. I don't know. What do y'all think? Do y'all think, you know, that could be something that's possible? Or, you know, am I just reaching at straws here? Thanks so much for the voice message. I'm really glad you're enjoying the, enjoying the podcast. It's great to hear a Star Trek fan who's enjoying the podcast as well. Um, and in terms of, of the character being a Vulcan rather than a Romulan, to be honest, I think I actually got the uh, description of her as a Romulan from um, from the Trek Wiki page, uh, and the reason I checked there was because I was just looking for her name. Um, I really like the idea that this could be just a rebellious choice of uh, her son uh, to go out, go after someone that's the exact opposite of her mo- of his mother, um, someone that's very stable and very specific in their thinking. You know, this this idea of having a much more clarified mind, I suppose, than uh, than his mother, who's been going off for years trying to um investigate this thing and and uh, and going down a deeper and deeper hole that it could possibly be going for a Vulcan because it's the exact opposite of his mom you know we all do the opposite of what our parents want us to do so I like the idea that he's going after someone the exact opposite of his mom as kind of a rebellion that's a really interesting choice there Jacob yeah excellent stuff thanks Jacob for the the voicemail for sure yeah I think for me I kind of saw pointy ears and went Romulan because this is so Romulan heavy. Mm. Um, it's almost like you're, well, for me, it's almost like I'm forgetting that the Vulcans exist because, um, that they're not really, um, a huge part of this show. Mm. It, it, it's all about the Romulans. I think it's more likely to be the Vulcans given their much closer relationship. Uh, to Starfleet and to Earth yeah. um, and being part of the Federation, which the Romulans aren't. Um, you know, certainly in episode six now, we know that there is this former neutral zone, but that any crossing into it could be seen as an act of war. Yeah. Hence why um, there is this the diplomatic credentials that um, Picard needs so that actually... Um, I, I, I think the, the Starfleet officer says any, uh, Starfleet ship or Federation ship in that area, it will be classed as an act of war. So, mm. um, the, the tensions between Romulan and the Federation still exist massively here. Um, so it probably is more likely to be a, a Vulcan. Or if it is the Romulan as suggested by the wiki page, um, then yes, this would seem like a complete act of rebellion towards <laughs> uh, his mom, probably on a, a number of different levels. Um, certainly given she is a Romulan expert and probably because she couldn't trust a Romulan as far as she could throw them, mm-hmm. then um, this would almost seem like uh, sort of a smack in the face for us. So yeah, it's, uh, it, it's, it's an interesting thing that something, you know, a, a, as minor detail like that can have so much depth to it. So it's a, it's a good call out there, Jacob. Thanks uh, so much. Absolutely. And thanks again for listening. We also got some feedback over on our Facebook page uh, from Bob Phillips for episode six as well. He says, Narek, how could you? You bastard. Uh, <laughs> evil, red, angry face. Never trust a pretty boy, my mother said, always gets you into trouble. Mm-hmm. Um, yes, absolutely. Yeah. Um, Everybody always tells people about me like that. <laughs> Do you mean I'm in trouble? Something like that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, Bob also says, uh, in this episode, we learn that in space, no one can hear you play keepy uppy. Unless <laughs> they happen to be a guilty insomniac and fancying some company. Mm-hmm. Yes. Uh, well fancying something for sure um and finally bob says i very much enjoyed the brinksmanship which earned the diplomatic pass and the awe picard had for the xp project the unraveling of a life unlived was agonizing and wonderful and i hope space samurai boy survives me too actually bob um i really do hope that the space samurai uh survives his encounter with the romulans i really hope huey does as well um, but certainly he may be fired from his position, um, given that his employers are the Romulans. But mm-hmm. I hope they are all going to team uh, up shortly. That would be quite good to have Hugh along as well. It would, yeah. yeah and certainly with Seven of Nine arriving in as well. That could be a really good team. Um, it almost feels like it could be, uh, dare I say it, some 80s synth 
band that could be there. <laughs> it could be. I do. I do like that moment with uh, with you saying, you know, can you hold them off for a couple of minutes while we get this room sealed again? And Elnor goes, I won't need a couple of minutes. <laughs> He's just going to slaughter <laughs> anybody that comes along. I just think that's really an interesting touch. You know, he still thinks that this kid's there to defend him. He's not there to defend him. He's there to take out anybody who attacks. They're slightly different things. Um, <laughs> but yes, that moment where you see uh, Soji in in her room tagging everything going probable age 37 months um you know and it's going over and over again and she's smashing everything i was wondering why she didn't just scan herself just in case she did think that she was uh, synthetic herself but that didn't seem to cross her mind she just thinks everything in her life has been created uh, in the last 37 months an interesting touch and i know it's just how the line was written but i i don't know why it just completely stood out to me when she turns around to um Narek and is explaining the whole situation to him and says, nothing I own is older than three years. Yeah. And I went, she's an Android. 37 months is three years and one month. So actually everything she owns is older than three years. <laughs> <laughs> I said, her mind should know that, right? That she's saying everything is 37 months. <laughs> nothing I own is over three years. Everything you own is over three years. One month more than three years. <laughs> anyway, that's me being wonderfully pedantic again. yes it is <laughs> on to our final bit of voicemail from steve brown hello tv podcast industries this is steve this is for the latest episode of picard the impossible box uh absolutely enjoyed this this episode i really really liked it i uh, uh these last two episodes have been really really good uh, mm-hmm. and it's uh, uh tough to pick which one is better i guess the previous one because it had uh jerry ryan but this one was really really good <laughs> i i like that we have an activated soji now uh that she's about to learn her what she I is and uh, so i'm excited for that uh very uh philip k dick of uh, the story with Narek telling her, well, maybe someone put false memories inside you. Uh, I really liked that. But then, of course, his uh, inevitable betrayal uh, by leaving her in that room was just uh, was heartbreaking for mm-hmm. her. But uh, it did send her straight into the willing hands of Picard. So, um, yeah, uh, again, I'm really, really enjoy uh, this episode, I, I thought the end, the beginning with Gerardi and Rios getting together was a little bit predictable, but at the same time uh, was kind of cool, especially with us knowing that she kind of has a darker side to her. Uh, so, and uh, I guess her explanation of Maddox's death was satisfying to them, and they didn't turn to the EMH to find, to get any, uh, information, or maybe she was able to delete, uh, the information from the EMH. I don't know. Maybe we'll find out later or not. No big, uh, can't wait to hear your guys thought. Talk to you later. Thanks, Steve. You see, Steve's on my side about the idea of why didn't they just ask the emergency medical hologram what happened? <laughs> I, we have it, we have logs that say that that came alive twice yesterday at the point when he died. Maybe we should check that out. I agree. I <laughs> totally agree that um, you know normally in a fully functioning Starfleet ship, mm-hmm. yes, there will be the people to do that investigation. True. I suspect with this threadbare crew, that's not mm-hmm. something that they're going to do. Mm-hmm. And it seems that at least Jean Luc does trust Dr. Gerasi. So he has no reason to disbelieve what she is saying to him, um, given their, their, their previous contact. Yeah. Um, or dare I say it, their first contact. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I, I, I think there's no reason to. And yeah. again, it may be simply that she has been able to delete those files to, to remove any trace. Yeah. So again, you would need to be doing some kind of data sweep to see that there had been a deletion at that point to True. maybe cotton on to it. So, um, and, and, I, and like I, that you say a uh, thread per crew when like seven of the crew, I think are holograms at the moment. No, well, it's not but, seven as before, but, but yeah, I mean, unless one of the holograms is taking on that role mm-hmm. and, and would alert them to it. And I think we, we had this conversation that, that, that might be mm-hmm. the case. I think at this moment, the only person I think who would or could do that is probably Rafi. Mm-hmm. Um, and that, you know, in one of her drunken stupors, she is checking something out. She's doing something, um, whether it's to determine 
course projection or whatever it may be that she comes across the fact that there has been a deletion from the medical records um so uh yeah i I think that's an interesting thing i do like as well steve that you bring up uh philip k dick as well Mm -hmm. in a sense um you know uh, following on from mary shelley i I did think does so she dream of electric sheep um or in that sense um this idea of consciousness and whether androids with Mary Shelley, it's about, um, you know, in, in creating the monster of Frankenstein um, and, and the perceptions and projections of other people as to what he is mm-hmm. rather than what he actually is in, in himself and consciousness. And this is similarly uh, with Philip K. Dix. It's about the consciousness of an android and their dreams. Yes. Does this make them, um, you know, sentient in the sense of like humans with mm-hmm. with the consciousness so th- this episode certainly has those themes of mary shelley and philip k dick uh, in respect to his book do androids dream of electric sheep which of course is blade runner of course. Um, and so <laughs> yeah it's great sci-fi that um i i think for sure absolutely i was wondering what, what was the question the frank or well the creature asked in penny dreadful is uh when he gets brought back to life he's asking the question of why did you allow me to feel? Because that's the thing that causes the most pain. So yeah. I wonder, is that, you know, part of the concept of why are you allowing her to dream when actually inside her dreams, she knows that she's not a human. She knows she is something created. So exactly. that's what she's finding out here. But, yeah. I, I, I like that uh, notion from Narek, you know, the, the cognitive dissonance as her physical makeup as this synthetic is going to lead her on a path that ultimately will bring who she currently thinks she is as to what she is in reality into conflict one, with one another. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and you have that uh, around uh, Philip K. Dick's book and Mary Shelley in mm-hmm. a different sense, obviously not with androids, but yeah. with reanimated people exactly. uh, and whether they regain the memories of the previous person or whether they create new ones. Mm-hmm. So it, it, yeah, it, it's a really interesting concept, very sci-fi heavy. And so absolutely perfect for Star Trek Picard. Absolutely. Yep. Thanks so much for your feedback, Steve. As always, love to hear your voicemails and love to hear all the feedback from everybody about these episodes. We're really enjoying talking about Star Trek Picard. Yeah. Thanks so much, Steve, Bob and Jacob for all that feedback. Absolutely. One last thing to do on this episode. Let's go off to 10 forward for our pub quiz question. John. Yes. Well, fellow Trekkers and Trekkies, yes, we are in 10 forward for the pub quiz. Go grab yourself a tumbler of that Earth whiskey, uh, of course, on the rocks, if you so wish a mm-hmm. little dash of water. In fact, dare I say it, just one rock of ice is the best. Yes. Uh, don't flood it with water or ice, dare also I say Also, don't it. fill an entire tumbler full of whiskey as well. That's quite a lot. Well, it is, yes. <laughs> but my question uh, for this episode how many pieces make up each side of narek's romulan rubik's cube Ooh, i didn't even notice that one that's going to be interesting yes and i think it's a little more complicated than we may think since and this is a clue fellow trekkies and trekkers the edges are not flush with one another they have raised pieces Ooh, i am really intrigued i love when you have a question that i don't know the answer to in here i don't know whether i know the answer to it either but (laughs) we will find out sure enough I hope so. I hope so. I uh, just want to point out when, when we get the emails in from uh, some of our wonderful listeners with the pub quiz, they do send in little comments and little notes. I uh, just wanted to point out one of them that I loved this week. We got an, an email in from Bob after the four questions that you asked last last week that all had numerical answers, John. Yes. And Bob asked the question whether we now know your PIN number <laughs> for, for your uh, I for must your go cards. to the bank. Because <laughs> it was a four-digit number. <laughs> that is That's true, a, yes. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you don't. I'm assured that John will change his uh, his pin number from now on uh, thanks very much john what's the question one more time for everybody yes the question is how many pieces make up each side of narek's romulan rubik's cube of death <laughs> excellent excellent thank you so much for joining us for this episode you can send in the answer to that question to feedback at tvpodcastindustries.com and the person who answers the most questions correctly at the end of the series 
will win a special Star Trek Picard prize, including a behind-the-scenes book of Star Trek Picard, which we think we have secured now. Um, it comes out on the 10th of March, so we think we have one secured uh, just for you, the winner of this competition. Yes, um, exciting prizes. Can we announce anything else that's in the prize pack, John? Yes, I think we can. We also have a... Federation pin badge as well from the premiere of Star Trek Picard that was held there earlier this year yep. at Leicester Square in London. Um, and I think there may be a smattering of other uh, little objects for your enjoyment mm -hmm. as well. Yep. So go back, listen to the episodes, get the pub quiz questions or pop onto the website at tvpodcastindustries.com. I've written up all the questions on each of the episodes there. Send in your answers to them and you could be in the chance to win the prize pack of picard Ooh, so many peas so many peas <laughs> we'll be back next week for our discussion for star trek picard episode 7 nepenthe written by samantha humphrey and michael shabon and directed by doug arniokoski and as i mentioned before if you want to hear more of us if you're stuck indoors with storm jorge or you're stuck indoors because you're not allowed out in case you get the coronavirus pop on over to our Patreon account over on patreon.com slash TV podcast industries. There's five episodes of our Penny Dreadful rewatch podcast out there at the moment with three more coming each week until we get to the release of Penny Dreadful City of Angels on April 26th. We're really enjoying talking about Penny Dreadful. So hopefully you can join us for that one. Bye bye, fellow Trekkies and Trekkers. Keep watching the stars. As always, fellow Trekkies and Trekkers, thank you so much for listening. It's been a pleasure speaking with you. And of course, remember... Keep watching, keep listening, and engage. Bye. Bye.